and welcome to Mitaka Talks. Our guest uh, for today's Mitaka Talks is Ben Robinson, who is co-founder of Aperture, a strategy consultancy that helps design, build, launch, and scale digital era businesses in the, in the financial service sector. Before Ben uh, was started Aperture, he worked at the banking software company Temenos, where he was chief strategy officer, and prior to that was an equity analyst covering the software and IT sectors. Today, we're going to be discussing the finance from a new 40,000 word report that Aperture has published on the wealth industry entitled Digital Age Wealth Management, including the role of crypto and blockchain in wealth management. Ben, welcome. Hi, Seamus. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm a big fan. <laughs> well, great to have you here. So, so why don't we just dive right in then? Digitization, I mean, it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, why, why do you think this is accelerating private banking and wealth management? Yeah, um, so you're right. Digitization is not a new phenomenon. I would say we almost have like digitization fatigue, right? Because we, you know, we keep talking about it. And I think we will sort of talk about it in a limited context as well. We tend to talk about sort of new technologies, new customer channels. And we forget that digitization is much more, right? The much more interesting stuff is the sort of second order, you know, um, implications when everything becomes more networked. Um, but anyway, so why do we think digitization is accelerating in wealth management? Well, there's always like a catalyst. People don't sort of spend loads of money on technology without a catalyst. And in a lot of parts of banking, I think regulation is acting as a catalyst, PSD2, for example. But in wealth management, we think it's more demographic changes that are starting to catalyze digitization and new business models and you know by that you know i'll give you one example right which is i think it's something like 1.5 trillion dollars is being passed down from baby boomers to their kids or grandkids every single year and those kids and grandkids have very different expectations about what kinds of services they want to receive mm. the channels over which they want to receive those services and you know, I think that's acting as, as a much stronger catalyst for, for banks and wealth managers to change and, you know, and to change their business models than just, you know, the fact that, you know, cloud computing exists. And so, um, you know, and, and there are others, right? There are other catalysts too. I mean, you know, um, for example, you know, women are controlling a large, much larger proportion of, of assets than in the past and they have very different, um, you know, needs and preferences. And they also have a much higher... Um, churn rate than, than traditional or than male customers. And so I think all of these things are starting to come together and, you know, mm. it's the risk of losing customers, I think, that's sort of concentrating the mind for wealth managers and private banks. I mean, it's an interesting comment on the generational change. I mean, as you know, Metak was involved in the, the crypto asset space and we talked to private banks. For them to a degree, getting involved is almost existential. I mean, they've got their, their client base, which is probably 60 plus, and how do they how do they engage with the millennials that are inheriting all this wealth who want to trade crypto? And as you say, through new digital channels, which particularly in the case of Swiss banking, previously it was about privacy and secrecy and passing your account balance over on a napkin at a, at a fancy restaurant, not, yeah, no, not I, engaging I, through digital channels. I think it's a very good point, which is, you know, like this is why I think we need to take a sort of broader lens when we think about digitization, because, you know, as you, as you rightly said, one of the hardest things to overcome for a private bank or a wealth manager is cultural factors you know so that you're right i mean they for, for generations they've thought about themselves as kind of locking up customer assets you know and how do they suddenly become part of a network where they sort of you know become they help introduce customers to third-party products and services i mean these yeah. things are quite really quite difficult cultural changes that need to take place in addition to everything else the technology the business model etc so um it's not i'm not saying digitization is easy i'm just saying that i think it's now um, or we think it's now accelerating we had some interesting, I mean, you just referenced it here and you had some interesting comments in your, in the report around business models, this kind of supply side versus demand side. What, why are these business models changing and why is that so relevant to wealth management? Yeah. So I th again, like to make the risk of sort of laboring the point, right? I think, you know, technology by itself doesn't normally result in material changes mm -hmm. in, in propositions. What, what normally results in changing customer propositions is new business models. And the reason we stress that so much in the report is like for two reasons. The first one is that if you don't take a business model approach to digitization, you're probably going to make a whole bunch of bad choices along the way. You know, so you, you, you and I both know, right, that so many projects start out because, you know, a board member or a CEO or whatever will read, will read something in the FT, right, come to work on a Monday and say, okay, innovation team, your job for the next two months is to go out, find the best AI vendor, you know, run a proof of concept. 
And those mm. things, they, they're so seldom deliver any value, right? Because, you know, they, um, you know they're, they're side projects, right? They're peripheral. They can be easily killed off by the corporate immune system. And also, you know, they're, they weren't sort of requested by the business. And so these things are really vulnerable. So I think unless you take a business model approach, um, you know, you probably make some bad choices. And then secondly, you have to make a conscious choice about where you're going to sit in the new digital sort of value chain, right? And, you know, the way we see it, like at the risk of sort of oversimplifying is you've got almost like three choices. You can attempt to aggregate demand, right? So you can, um, you can use the pull of your existing customer base to try to um, aggregate all the services that those customers might want. So, you know, rather than just sort of, you know, building a portfolio for them, you help introduce them to, I don't know, the best ESG provider. You help introduce them to, you know, unsecured lending that they might need. You help introduce them to legal services they might need, right? And I think that's not necessarily an easy thing to do because, you know, there's cultural change needed. Um, you know, you're competing against other aggregators, right? So anybody yeah. who... Yeah, you know, people have large engagement through their platforms, but it's possible. And then the other choice is you attempt to aggregate supply, right? So, um, you know, this is something, you know, an example here is like Goldman Sachs with Marcus, right? So they've made a decision that they're going to offer up their regulated platform to others that either want to build propositions on top or, or, or want to embed banking into their, into their distribution channel. Okay. So that's, that's another option, right? Um, which is you offer up, you know, your, your bank, your, your, your license, your custody services, your balance sheet to others, right? And then the last one is that you could be some sort of niche provider. Are you, you know, you might choose that you want to become really specialized on say structured products or something. But the problem is that these things have to be conscious choices because there's a lot of, you know, changes that need to be made in order to arrive at that destination you know, as we talked about technology, cultural changes, et cetera. And I think if you kind of sleepwalk into this, not make a conscious decision, then the worst outcome is like the market decides that you're a niche provider and you haven't sort of adjusted the, co the, the cost base, the proposition to actually succeed in that, with that business model. And so, you know, I think you really need to sort of take a conscious choice here. And I think all of these things will require long-term strategic planning. And so you kind of, you, you know, you've got to start now to, to be figuring this stuff out. And I mean, how does the bank or how do the financial institutions look at that framework, like the technology implications of, you know, potentially moving from this monolithic supply side sort of framework to a, in, you know, the opposite extreme, the embedded finance side. I mean, how, how, how does the firm supposed to start that, that analysis? Well, um, <clears throat> so, I mean, the truth is that not many people are taking this kind of, business model approach yet even even though we would suggest it's like imperative um but i think the important thing to look at if, you know if we think about the technology implications of this is that you know banking is likely to split into three different layers right so um if if, if we accept the premise that bankings can become over time more embedded in other services and other distribution channels then the first thing that we, the first layer will be distribution right and then we, we've talked about how, you know, distribution splitting from manufacturing. So you're going to have a whole bunch of like, you know, a long tail of manufacturing of, of, of banking manufacturers, right? And then what you'll need in the middle is some kind of orchestration that matches, you know, the many um, manufacturers with the many um, distribution channels. And so, you know, if they're the different roles that you could, you could, um, occupy within the banking value chain, then the technology has to kind of mirror that. So the way we see the technology um, stack um, kind of evolving is that you're gonna have inter, you know, kind of interaction or, ch or channels, then you're gonna have sort of record keeping for the sort of manufacturers. And then you're gonna have, you know, kind of some kind of orchestration intelligence system in the middle. And um, so I think, you know, if, when people look at what sort of systems that they need, you know, I think that's, the kind of framework that they should apply to this, which is, you know, I'm going to need something that can enable me to orchestrate um, uh, services, which means I need to pull together multiple data sets, right? So if I'm going to be able to offer up kind of contextual advice, contextual offers, um, then I need to I need to pull together more than just kind of financial information. I need to understand contextual information about my customer, locational information about my customer, and then you, if you're going to aggregate services as well, you know, again, you need to, you need to be able to you can't do that in a sort of record keeping system. You need to do that in a different system. And that requires you to have you know, an extensible product catalog, for example. So I think this is, I think this is the way that this will increasingly play out. 
And, and, and how, I mean, traditionally, you worked previously for a core banking system. I mean, if, if a bank is looking at this sort of strategy or at this kind of change in their business model, is there a, I mean, the obvious question is, is there still a one size fits all solution? Can they go to a core banking provider and get everything they need? Or is that an anachronistic way to think about what, what will fulfill their requirements? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I think the question is, you know, like almost, can, will a bank be able to provide everything you want over time? And I, I think the right. answer to that is, is no, right? I think we're heading into this new world where everything is, is ecosystem based. And, you know, it will, in the same way that, you know, the, the banking will become more ecosystem based, the systems have to become more ecosystem based. So I, I think the short answer is it's going to be really difficult to, I'm not saying, not, I wouldn't say you couldn't get everything from the same supplier potentially, um, or the core infrastructure from the same supplier, but you're going to need separate systems for, for, for um, you know, for interaction, in, um, orchestration and record keeping. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that, that you know, the, the suppliers that offer an end-to-end, -end, you know, set of solutions are, you know, a potent, potentially anachronistic, but they have to have unbundled those solutions into three layers, we'd say. And, you know, as, as crypto, as, you know, the world's increasingly talking, at least in our space, the financial space is increasingly talking about a tokenized world. So crypto, you know, kind of consuming finance as we know it and reinventing it in, in token-based form. So do you, think, do you think this applies to the crypto space as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think everything is heading in the same direction because everything is becoming more networked. And the critical, you know, and I think the most interesting part to play in the whole fintech ecosystem, and that applies to crypto as well, is that middle layer. Because, you know, because the characteristic of a sort of record keeping system is something that has to just run as quickly as possible, as, you know, be as scalable as possible, will run in the public cloud. You know, channels, I think, as we discussed, will increasingly probably not be banked proprietary channels. So all the value, whether you're a system supplier on the one side or, or you know, or a financial services company on the other, sits in that middle layer. And they're increasingly coming together, right? Because, you know, what, what was formerly sort of B2B or B2C, these things are kind of merging. And I think the whole banking as a service space is super interesting because, you know, is a banking as a service provider, is that a technology provider? Is that a B to B to C financial services provider. You know, I think these things become quite blurred. And I think in the crypto space, um, you'll see the same thing, right? Which is you'll start to see the same sort of ecosystem evolve around crypto that we, we, we're seeing evolve around, around banking, which is, you know, you'll need, a, you'll need a platform that sits in the middle that can orchestrate between sort of many issuers, um, you know, many custodians, many sort of, you know, trading venues. But, and then on the other side, between all the all the brands and all the all the distribution ch channels into which you would want to embed um, crypto assets, tokens, etc. So I think yeah, I think you'll see exactly the same thing play out in crypto. So you're not really looking. We're no longer looking at a model that's a strict vertical. Basically, it's much more a many-to-many -many sort of network. And effectively, what my understanding, my takeaway from what you're describing is basically that say the new core infrastructure for a financial institution or anybody operating the space is this orchestration layer you described. Right? Correct. Yeah. And I mean, what are the key? I mean, what just for people that aren't really familiar with what orchestration means? What, what do you what do you exactly mean when you say orchestration? So, exactly as you, I think the best description is the one you just used, which is it's. Um, you know, if, if we're moving to a, to a world where, and, you know, that's increasingly networked, then there has to be a system that manages the interaction between, you know, many, all, all the different constituents of that network. So, and, you know, what are the characteristics of that system? Well, you know, it needs to be able to mesh together multiple data sets. Um, you know, it needs to draw intelligence from multiple data sets. It needs to be able to handle the, you know, aggregate the offerings of many different services. Um, you know, so I think it's a, it's a different proposition from, from a record keeping system because, you know, it's essentially so it amalgamates the output of many record keeping systems. Um, and, you know, and I, th and I think the, the, the reason it's sort of happening faster is because in the beginning, what happened with systems when, you know, with the first sort of phase of digitization is, you know, it was important to allow the customer to self-serve to a certain extent. So, you know, so sort of, you know, a thin channels layer was opened up to the customer where the customer could, I don't know, query their balance or, you know, set up a simple payment order or whatever. Now we're moving into a situation where, you know, the, 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 the um, so many other things are accessing our, our banking information that 
you know, the first reason to split orchestration from record keeping is to cope with just the increase in interactions. So if, if, if mm. you, if every time I query my bank, my bank balance, that requires me to, to query the, the record keeping system, it's just not going to scale. Right. And the, the sort of the, um, the model here is e-commerce. So if you, you know, if, if when we use um, Amazon, for example, you know, we use it, there's a sort of thin mobile, a thin client on our, on our mobile phone, right? And so we can, we, we sort of open up the Amazon interface. There's, there's a distribution system that sits behind that. So if we quit querying, you know, looking for a book, it will, it will give us the options of the books that are available. And then once we select something, it will asynchronously sort of send that order to be picked. It will asynchronously send that order to the, to the accounting system. And that's, and the reason it does that is because, you know, that, that distribution system is, you know, it, it, it can't query the, you know, the, the warehouse every time somebody's searching for something because the thing, you know, the thing wouldn't scale. And also it needs to pull into that distribution system, all the offers from all the Amazon merchants that are also distributing through, through Amazon. Yeah. So that's kind of like the architectural model that, that banks will have to, to have to adopt. It's the same thing that, you know, we see the same thing kind of more or less already in capital markets. So it's, it's just, you know, banking will have to mirror to much greater extent capital markets in the way that it sets up its systems. And to the degree what you're describing is a much more complex landscape. I mean, you mentioned in, in, the, in, your, um, in the wealth management report you published that uh, enterprise, you know, enterprise software analysis is broken. So, I mean, I think for those procurement departments that can navigate the space, how to, it must be quite a challenge how to navigate this. Uh, and then you, you've, I think you've talked about in your, in your report about it, you've got a new methodology to fix it. What, what, what is that? Yeah, so, so we introduced um, a new software methodology um, or evaluation methodology, which we call the market map. And th the reason we did it is just because when, you know, with the work that we do with, with, um, with companies, they quite often sort of say to us, okay, you know, we, 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 we suggest to them what might be, you know, a, a, a business model transition that makes sense. And then the next question is, okay, what software do we pick to be able to, to sort of, you know, to be able to deliver that new business model. And if you go to some of the traditional vendor analysis it's just it, you know it just doesn't help because you know a th these analysis are sort of pay to play right so there's very few providers in the analysis and they t and obviously if you pay to you, you know the likelihood is you're quite a large vendor yep. secondly um we think the criteria just kind of doesn't make sense anymore and also, and also kind of favors larger vendors so you know, the sorts of things that these methodologies look at is functional breadth you know, and we would argue that in this sort of new world of SaaS software and APIs and so on, it's much easier to source functionality than it was in the past. Your integration has become much easier. So functional breadth matters less than it did in the past. And then that, the other stuff that they tend to look at is, you know, sort of maturity of the vendor. So how many integration partners does the vendor have? How many offices does the vendor have? You know, what's their annual revenues? Um, how many employees do they have? And that sort of stuff, I mean, it just doesn't seem that important if you're trying to choose the best solution. And then the last thing is, you know, the, the whole weighting of functionality versus non-functional characteristics of the software for us is completely wrong. So, and, and, and there, you know, the, and I'm not saying this is 100% a sort of definitive rule, but more, more or less, the older the vendor, the less likely they are to score well on non-functional requirements because they've got so much technology debt. And so, you know, when, when we did the, the market map for, for wealth management, in fact, I'll show it to you. And I was really impressed when Mike yeah, McClone uh, a couple of weeks ago shared his screen. So I'm going to... Um, yeah, it felt like we're on a Bloomberg channel. So that's great. We just need to if you do that. It'd be wonderful. I, the problem is I should have prepared earlier because there are too many things open. Hold on one second. I'll try to find it. Um, okay. I can't, <laughs> I can't find it. So, um, oh, there you go. There you go. Oh. About it. So, so let me just script to the to the market map. So this this is what it looks like for wealth management, right? So, so we, we've chosen completely different criteria. So we we're, we're interested in the extent to which a provider can can um, can can enable a, a, a wealth manager or a private bank to introduce new technology. This this isn't specific to, to private banking, by the way. You know this. This, um, this could be applied to, to any industry. And then the other thing we're interested in is the extent to which the provider can help the wealth manager or private bank to, to, um, to change its business model. And 
you know what's what's interesting is you know we and we 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 first of all show how these vendors look in the old paradigm right on conventional criteria and then we show how they look on our new criteria and the interesting thing is nobody stays in the same place right six <laughs> six vendors six vendors move up seven vendors move down right so it, so as well as sort of illustrating the extent to which the criteria are different, I think it really illustrates the extent to which there's a changing of the guard, right? Because the things that used to matter in the past just don't matter to the same extent anymore. Right. So, so if you think about it, when, when integration was really hard, you know, it made sense to buy a very, very, you know, broad application because yeah. integrating all those different parts would have been hard. So, you know, it made sense to buy SAP R3 because you had, you know, accounting, warehousing, you know, all that stuff, you know, all that stuff together in one application, but it makes less sense to do that now because um, the world has changed, right? And also, as we've discussed, banking is increasingly sort of breaking up. So, um, yeah, so we thought it was time to introduce a new methodology and, um, and we're going to be applying this to, to other se sectors and other segments of uh, financial services. I mean, it's fascinating. So what comes to mind when I think about, um, let's say, the, this, this, you've got a, kind of a quadrant framework here. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is Gartner's magic quadrant. How would this differentiate from that? Is that, is that one of the legacy companies you're talking about as well? Um, so, so I didn't really want to be so, so specific um, and, you know, to criticize any one provider. But I think, I think it's fair to say that all of the providers use more or less the same criteria. Right. You know, so, you know, so, so you know, if you were to look at um, an evaluation like the Magic Quadrant for, say, core banking, right? The, first of all, you know, there aren't very many, very many, very many vendors on that quadrant. I think, you know, I, I guess there's sort of six or seven, right? Um, maybe maximum. And then they're all in the top right-hand quadrant because, you know, they're all, the, the vendors that are all in there have been, ex they've existed for a long period of time. So they've all got, they're all functionally rich. They've all got lots of offices, et cetera. So, it's actually not even that helpful to help you to, you know, build a shortlist of vendors that you might want to look at. And then if you actually look at the names that are on there, it's missing some really critical ones, you know, like, you know, we would argue something like Thought Machine should be something you should look at. You know, if you want to run a, you know, really high scalability, really low cost per transaction, not on there, you know. So, um, yeah, so I, th I think, it, I think it, from our point of view, it was, it was time to take a fresh look at this. Question here. So I think you've answered this in part, so don't need to just look at I'll read it to you here. This, this split in wealth management architecture stack is a very interesting record versus intelligence, orchestration versus engagement. I wonder, does that mirror or at least foretells what will happen in the crypto tech stack? Systems of records such as custody being separated from intelligence while engagement being invisible or embedded in other day services? So that, that was the question. And maybe just put it in the context of, you know, are you also going to be looking at a, at, at a crypto map, sorry, a, the same sort of mad market map around crypto? Yes, so we are. So the, the ones that... Um... Yeah, crypto is, I think, probably the one we'll do next or, you know, or, or, or next but one because, you know, uh, so first of all, I don't think there's anything that looks orchestration systems full stop. So, so I think, you know, this is a gap. And then, and then what we're going to do is, is look at um, these, these, you know, these segments one by one. So I think that, you know, if we were to even draw a qu quadrant of like, you know, of, of the most interesting markets for us to look at, crypto is interesting because it's new, because nobody's really looked at it from the let through the lens of orchestration systems. And there are very few vendor analyses anyway. So we definitely do crypto. And, you know, one, one point I wanted to make earlier on, which was, you know, I don't think we talked too much about the relevance of crypto to, to wealth management yet. But, right. Yeah. yeah but because I think you know, um, you talked about it being a bit existential. But I mean, could you imagine if you imagine how many private clients have been asking over the last year? You know, can can, can we can we get some Bitcoin exposure in, in our portfolios? At the same yeah. time, as sort of Bitcoin's gone up, I think what five hundred percent, six hundred percent in the last year. And so it, you know, it was it was you know, you'd be pretty annoyed if you over that whole period, you you know, your your private bank said no. Our policy is not to, to, you know, to, to have any anything to do with with Bitcoin. So I think Bitcoin itself is, you know, and cryptocurrencies are becoming a more important investable asset. But I think the much bigger opportunity is around tokenization. And and I think what's interesting here is like, you know, the the reason I think it's so difficult for people to get liquidity for some of these assets, you know, for, you know, what people call sort of. Um, non-investable assets, you know, passion assets, racehorses, these kinds of, is because mm. banks still operate in this sort of, you know, this vertically integrated monolithic structure, right? Which is, you know, if, if I would, if you were my private banker, Seamus, and I came to you and I said, look, I need some, I need some cash. Um, I'm prepared to sort of offer my racehorse 
as as um you know as collateral i mean you as a bank would say okay that's really difficult for us because we're not we don't know how to value a resource um you know our risk model doesn't allow for that kind of asset class you know we're really uncomfortable lending against that whereas you know i'm sure there are thousands of people out there who want to get exposure to resources as an asset class right so i think increasingly banks have to figure you know have to make this um sort of mindset transition that your value to them is is as a customer right not necessarily as somebody they have to upsell across a whole bunch of services to they need to, and their value to you is to act as the conduit into an ecosystem of providers that can help you get what you need in this case you know some liquidity and so i think you know, I think, again, when we talk about sort of tokenization, people get very, very, you know, they tend to focus on the mechanics of it. You know, how will we do, you know, how will we do AML? How will we, like, issue these tokens? You know, if we're thinking about security tokens, you know, who produces the prospectus? And, all this, and, I, th- and I think kind of all that stuff is interesting, for, for sure, and we need to figure it out. But, the, but I think we need to look at this in the context of, like, broader, you know, the sort of the platformatization of banking. And I think it's kind of inevitable that, this will happen and so um, you know all these things we'll, we'll, we'll figure them out and so so that's what i mean i think th- that mindset shift change is bigger than the technology change and it's bigger you know and and so i th- always think like once you've figured out what your business model is the hardest thing for you to then change is is, is your is the cultural sort of pediments to introduce it I mean, I think that's a very good point. And I think, you know, as you described, most people at the moment are focused on the technical aspects of things like tokenization, but that's really missing the point of how it can transform a business model of a bank. And the example you described around the horse one is good. I mean, banks typically approach lending as a, as a balance sheet business. You know, they, they, they lend versus the balance sheet where they can move into the tokenization space and have and leverage their network, which obviously they have the, the on-ramps, let's say, or basically the large client bases. And they can just go to a fee model facilitating basically that network to interact with each other, whether that's one client tokenizes, the other invests, and they broker the effectively broker that transaction and then charge a fee for that. And they don't need yeah, to they don't need any leverage of the balance sheet at all, basically. Yeah, and, and it's you're right. So it's a less yeah. asset intensive business. Um so yeah. therefore it's likely to be higher margin, but it's also dramatically more scalable. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the world is your oyster in that case, basically. It really transforms the business model. Yeah. And, and, um, and you know, the, the hard thing is, because I, I suppose, is, you know, you're going up against any platform that has loads of engagement, loads of customers. Yeah. But I just think the, the one advantage that wealth managers, private banks have, you know, particularly mm-hmm. vis-a-vis like retail banks, for example, is, you know, rich people are pretty serious about money, right? And I think the, the extent of trust that incumbent organizations have should not be underestimated and i think that's a you know because you, you, to, to be an aggregator you need some combination of trust and engagement and the you know private banks have plenty of trust not that much engagement i would argue that sort of social media companies e-commerce companies have loads of engagement probably not enough trust potentially to do um, well particularly top high net worth ultra high net worth type aggregation that, that, that leads very well into the question that just came up. Um, how will the wealth management client experience look in three to five years? Today, it seems all the incoming players do the same, whilst the innovative startups seem to miss market acceptance. I think it kind of goes directly to the point you just made. Yeah, so I think, um, well, I mean, I think there's probably two avenues here, right? Which is this, so I think we'll, 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 use, an, we'll, we'll use an aggregated service over time, right? So mm-hmm. I think this idea that you go to, you know, to a private bank and they'll offer you all their own products and services, yeah. a limited range and so on, is, is not going to be the way this plays out. So so it's instead, you probably either consume wealth management embedded through something else. So at, at the moment, you, you know, all the, many of the super apps offer wealth management, right? So Gojek, you know, WeChat. Right. You, could, you could easily get access to sort of mutual funds or, you know, or automated investment services through your super app. Um, you know, the like employee wellness apps increasingly offer um, wealth management services as well as saving services. So you might get it through your employer, for example, or if you go direct to a wealth manager, that wealth manager will offer you a whole, you know, a very broad range of services that help you to do more, much more than just manage your wealth, help you to make better financial and commercial decisions. So it'd be a much broader offering than when we're used to, I think. And I also think, you know, one of the things we observe in the report is a lot of conflation of, of, of kind of, different customer segments you know what was once the preserve of the ultra high net worth 
you know, mm. access to sort of private assets, asset, uh, access to sort of, you know, private equity, pri you know, venture debt, uh, you know, private debt, um, real estate. This kind of stuff is, is increasingly being democratized. So I think both a broader range of services and a kind of deeper range of services is what you should expect over time through, through wealth managers. So it sounds like basically if they, if they get the business model reinvention right, they've got a much more scalable business going forward, much bigger opportunity potentially than, than this uh, effectively bespoke hand-to-hand -hand sort of relationship delivers right now, which may not be fit for the future, basically. Yeah, and it seems, it seems so I know we're running out of time, but it seems to me that a bit, yeah. you know, to, to think about your business as, okay, digitization offers me the, you know, gives me the opportunity to offer exactly the same services. Exactly. But, yeah. but, through, but through a mobile device. It's just, you know, come on. I mean, w w this is a paradigm shift. We should embrace it and we should figure out how we can change our business model will deliver just a, a dramatically different proposition to the end customer. That's, that's the challenge and the opportunity here. Well, that's a nice summary, um, Ben. It's been great to have you on, we'll wrap up. I mean, I think, how can people find the report and how can people get in touch with you? Um, yeah, so, so if you want to be in the crypto market map, uh, drop me an email. My email is ben at aperture.co. If you want to read our report or, or you know, the blogs and summaries we have on, on our website, you can go to aperture.co or aperture.co. This is forward slash the hyphen market hyphen map. And, and you, you'll be able to access all the resources <laughs> on there. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Ben, for being here today. So our, our next Metago talk will be on March 19th. We'll have Alexander Bechtel, who's the head of DLT and digital asset strategy, strategy at Deutsche Bank. Thanks for joining Metago Talks today and see you next time. Thank you, Seamus. Thanks, Ben.